as the old clock on the wall says, it's 9.30. It's, it's time to start, okay? Um, Yesterday I was speaking to a member of the church, <clears throat> and the topic came up, and I have kind of forced the topic up about how do I usually end my lessons. And it is, if I've said something wrong, I want to know about it. And this person said, oh, no, no, you're okay, you're okay. Well, in my mind, I know that I get some of the details wrong. Now, when definitely if it's scripture, I do not want to be wrong, okay? Because there's a heavy price to be paid for that. Now, in some of the little stories that I give out, yeah, I'll mess up the details on those. Because sometimes, you know, your mind just kind of forms its own opinion and it inserts itself into the story. So even then... I don't mind if someone comes up here and tells me, you messed this up. Okay, let's get it straightened out here. You know, why do you say that? And, you know, those sort of things. I, I take no pride, no pride in, 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 in all of what I do here in my speaking. But the one thing I want to be is right about what I'm speaking about. Not from a pride standpoint, but from what Scripture teaches. Okay? So I just want to make sure that that that's kind of understood whenever I say that. It's not, it's, I don't say it to be hollow without meaning. I mean what I say on that one, okay? So, does anybody remember anything about the topic that we're speaking about? I've been, this is like, I think the third, third week. Willpower is one of it, but one of the things is, is the question. And that's the title of the lesson, who or what is the enemy. Who is the enemy? Give that much thought? Well, the conclusion at the end of the day is that we are usually our own worst enemy. Okay? And part of that is due to lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge can also lead to lack of doing the right thing. So how do you know to act and behave to do anything especially that's pleasing to our Creator. What if you didn't have any knowledge? What would you do then? Um, <clears throat> does anybody in here recall, they made a movie twice of this. The book was written in 1951. And um, does anybody in here recall the story? It's called Lord of the Flies. You know the Lord of the Flies? You know the story about the Lord of the Flies? For those of you who don't know about the Lord of the Flies, it's about a shipwreck that occurred. And I forget how many boys, six or seven, maybe 15 in total, wound up as shipwrecked individuals on an island. And they're the only ones that were the survivors. But everybody, when the shipwreck, when the ship went missing, everyone assumed that they were, they were gone. Everyone was dead. Well, these individuals, most of them were, you know, young teenagers on up to a little bit older teenagers, tried to set out and live life the way they wanted to. It's a very interesting story, and it's an interesting movie to watch because you run into the situation of good versus evil. And in that story, which one wins out? Well, I won't tell you. Okay, I suggest to you that you either get the movie, either one of the movies, one one was an early black and white, the other is a color version of it, or just read the book, one of the two. But one of the things that occurred to me is, is I was thinking about all this, I, guess I just I saved this so I could read something to you right quick about this. Uh, this is an article that appeared in The Guardian. I don't know how many years ago it was, but it says the real Lord of the Flies. What happened when six boys were shipwrecked for 15 months? They were totally on their own by themselves. Now, the Lord of the Flies is a work of fiction, but this is a work of actual true life, okay? In the Lord of the Flies, things got completely out of control. They had actually killed a couple of kids because they wouldn't behave themselves the way someone had told them to. In the actual event, none of them, all of them looked out for themselves. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, the book of the Lord of the Flies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, um, so the question becomes: If we don't have this, what's our what's our innate behavior going to de- devolve or evolve into, or become? Chaos is what Lord of the Flies is about. But in this, the Guardian, the story, which is a true story, and if someone wants to read the story, I will forward this to you. That's the reason why I put this up here. But these six kids, well, they were teenagers, but they did the wrong thing. They stole a boat, intentionally stole a boat from a guy and sailed off. They fell asleep. When they woke up, there was a storm, and the storm busted a bunch of stuff on their little boat, and they wound up just by sheer luck on this little, basically a mountain sticking up out of the Pacific Ocean. And years, well, I think it was 15 months later, a guy actually found these people, just purely by accident. It's an excellent story. But in there, these guys actually looked out for each other. What little bit that their parents had done in raising them, they did good. They didn't do evil. But now, if we think about this in today's modern culture, and it's not just exclusive to the United States, but this has gone global. This teaches us to put ourselves in chains, doesn't it? Chains of good behavior. Not just running wild like you're a bunch of maniacs out you know, in the jungle somewhere, but look at what's happening in society, in our governance. No, in the Lord of the Flies, they didn't. But in, the, in this story here, in this one, they did. But the, the point being, is it innate in us to behave ourselves? Well, you should pose the question, behave yourselves? Well, behave how? Serve self? Serve others? What is one of the points, one of the main points of Christianity? Serve God, wherein when you serve God, you serve others. You don't ignore them. You see where this goes? So how do you know to do this? Let's just use Peter or or Paul or some of the other apostles, James. You know, I'm fond of quoting James. Did they have the New Testament to read? Who were, the, who were the apostles quoting from? Well, they quoted Jesus. They quoted quite a bit of the Old Testament, especially Paul. But you think about this for a minute. Gee whiz, how could they go back and examine what the apostles said? Absolutely. The Holy Spirit was at work with them. Okay? And part of the Holy Spirit's mission was to make sure that the apostles were putting out absolute truths. No confusion about it. Easy to understand. Because if you think about it, some people think that parables from Christ were hard to understand. No. If you'll just slow down a minute and quit trying to race through and see how many lines of Scripture you can read in 10 seconds or whatever, slow down and think about this stuff. Because one of the things that happens if you don't think about it, you will become your own worst enemy. And why would I say that? Well, how many different brands of church do we have worldwide? Was there any brand of church when the apostles were alive and were teaching? There was one brand. That's it. You either were in it or you weren't. It becomes that simple. But what happens when mankind takes it upon himself to, oh, well, we got to have a fancy robe. we got to have a fancy cap on our head, shoes, all this sort of thing. Now, I'm not saying that a preacher shouldn't stand up here without a suit on. That's a matter of respect, okay? Yeah, that's my opinion. So opinions are a dime a dozen, aren't they? So with all of this, to try and conquer this situation of You know, who's the enemy? Do you want to be your own worst enemy? What about Peter out in the garden? 
And they said, hey, that guy was with Christ. No, 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 I'm not. And he started cussing and doing things. What would those people think about Peter? Well, some of them knew for a fact that he had been hanging around with Jesus. So the first conclusion they're going to come to, that guy's a liar. Then they go, well, why is he lying? Because he's afraid. Afraid of what? Well, he might begin to suffer the same consequences that Christ is fixing to suffer. Because they knew what was going to happen to Christ. He's an enemy of the state, so to speak. So with all of these things, let's do a quick read. And I read this last week from Proverbs 25. And it's just one verse. It's the very end. It's verse 28. And this, this, this tells us all about self-will, self-control. It says, like a city that is broken into and without walls. Let me repeat that. Like a city that is broken into without walls. Well, what was the purpose of this walls around the old cities back then? To keep the enemies out, right? It's protecting them. So, like a city that is broken into and without walls, is a man, and you could substitute woman in this, is a man who has no control over his spirit. No control over his spirit. Well, wait a minute. Spirit. What is this? This spirit just kind of waft in and out of your mind? Some, some. Your spirit is there all the time. It, it, this consists of your thoughts, your mind. Sometimes we think about spirit. Well, anybody in here ever go to one of, when you're in high school and you went to a pep rally? Well, we got the spirit. Let's go over there and conquer the other football team. Beat the dog out of them. The spirit is a man who has no control over his spirit. I'm sorry, what's your Proverbs? Proverbs 25. Verse 28. Now, when you ask this question, is, is, does anybody in here have any friends that they might have had or acquaintances of someone that was, you just like, that guy's completely out of control. I've known a few of them. One of them is out of control back when he was a young man. I still talk to the guy on a regular basis. But he's calmed down quite a bit in his old age, especially after he had a big stroke in this side of his body. It doesn't work very well for him anymore. But he's still a bit of a wild man. And from time to time, and I'm not patting myself on the back, I take my shots with what Scripture has to teach. And every time you can see a quick pause for thought, you know, his, on, on his part of thought. Sometimes I want to ask him, what are you thinking? Because he realizes now, I remember his dad was quite wealthy, and he said, when my dad dies, we're going to have the biggest party you've ever seen in McAllen, Texas. It's going to be no holes barred. I asked him once not long back, when are we going to have that party in McAllen? I don't think we're going to have anything like that now. No, no. Age does things to us. But age should be one of those things where you have an accumulation of knowledge, shouldn't you? Do you know more now than when you were five years old? Do you know more now about Scripture? When Carrie showed up and when Carrie left? I know I did. I learned a lot from listening to that guy. Because it was one of those, he's one of those people that took the time to delve into Scripture. And it wasn't just because it was his job. It's because he desired it. He wanted to. I want to know what Scripture will teach me. Now, it's one thing to know Scripture. It's another thing to know that it's teaching you. But where's the application? We come back to Proverbs again. Is a man who has no control over his spirit. Will you allow the things that this teaches to maybe interfere with something that you know you're not supposed to be doing or help you to stop doing it altogether? I fight that fight every day. 
every day. And if you're honest with yourself, we all do. We got all these external influences. My wife's sitting here this morning and the other day, you know, yesterday. Look at these horrible commercials. Look at the stuff they're promoting. We'll change the channel. Don't leave it on there one second longer than you have to. You can vote with your pocketbook. Those sort of things. So we come back to that word willpower again. This is willpower. We'll just discuss it one more time. Willpower is a noun. It's a person, place, or a thing. It says the ability to control one's own actions, emotions, or urges. Strong determination that allows one to do something difficult. You go back to this true story about the, the Lord of the Flies. Not the book, but the true story. And you look, these guys determined early on, we're not going to get into big fights and stuff. They would have arguments, but they had what they called timeout. How many people in here applied timeout to your children? Slow yourself down and don't let over anger overcome your good judgments. To the point of, hey, if you run off one of your friends, I may be very guilty of that from a racquetball court incident over, a little over a year ago. So, again, willpower is a strong determination that allows me to do something difficult. Something difficult. Is it difficult to put two bucks, three bucks, five bucks, fifty into the contribution platter up there? So the lights can be paid. You can sit in air conditioned comfort. You got a microphone here and some maniac up here talking to you about things. Is it that difficult? And I'm just picking on money because money is one of the things that's a prime mover in our lives. Unfortunately, it is that way. And if it's not money, it's something else to do with riches of some sort. So, one last thing in self control. That's, that falls under the thing of willpower. Self-control, discipline, mastery, restraint, restraint. Where's restraint gone in our society these days? The chains have been cut off like with a, a hacksaw or a torch. Just pff, We don't need any of that stuff. And look at what's happening in the country. How many times this week did we read about some out of control mob shooting the place up. But of course it's the gun's fault, see? The gun that can lay on a table for a hundred years and never kill a person, but as someone, soon as someone picks it up, well, if it wasn't a gun, they could use a knife or a baseball bat or any other way to devise things. What about the politician from Russia that poisoned one of his enemies and just happened to catch the daughter at the same time because they were both drinking the same coffee? died from radioactive poisoning. What kind of evil mind develops that? Is that a mind of self-control? Well, maybe they think it's self-control in some way, but it's certainly not from a Christian standpoint, especially seeing as how this guy really likes to have some of the Christian influence, you know, through the, the I guess, the ordained priest. Now, I give all these things as quick examples here. Um, if you would, turn to Matthew 3. We went over this last week. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly because this is where we ended last week. But one of the things, if you notice, this is in Matthew 3. We're at the very beginning of Jesus. After he has grown up, he was given a task to do. And he did it. Okay? In, verse, you know, in chapter 3, it says, Now in those days John the Baptist came, preaching, preaching in the wilderness of, of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What is he referring to? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. He knew. He knew that Jesus was coming. Be forewarned. To be forewarned is to be forearmed. You know, to be forearmed is keeps you from having the burglar break in on you, right? Because after all, we'll just use the word devil. What is the devil after? He wants to take you away from what your appointed appointment should be, 
of trying to get to heaven. It's kind of a sneaky thing, isn't it? Well, after all, what did Eve do? Just a few words, one word, not change the complexion of the whole thing, and what happened to her? She chose to go against what the Creator said. One word. One word. How powerful is one word? See, this is what we've got to defend ourselves with, is this thing and what's contained in it. This is where you can develop this self-will. Because all of us are selfish to a certain extent. That's, we just can't get around it. But selfishness is to be brought under control. So, Matthew 3, let's just read from 7 through 10. But when he saw, this is John, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming, in, coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father, for I say to you that from these stones God is able to raise up children to Abraham. And pay particular attention to what it says in verse 10. The axe is already laid at the root of the trees. What is this axe he's talking about? God's judgment. Jesus is coming. Judgment is coming to the world. It's always been here, but it's right open now. The axe is already laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the parking lot. Oh, wait a minute. Doesn't it say thrown into the fire? Verse 11. As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He knows his place, doesn't he? Now, what's he been doing? He's been working earnestly for what the Creator has told him to do. He didn't, he didn't run off and hide somewhere and not do it. He is doing it. But look at this. Look at what he's saying. But he is coming after me. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And his winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor, and he will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff, chaff with the unquenchable fire. And I won't get off into the details of this. But we get to verse 13 now. Then Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you, and do, and do you come to me? And do you come to me? But Jesus, Jesus answering said to him, Permit it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Not part of it, or some of it, or just a little bitty bit, but it says all, all. Then he permitted him. Permitted him what? To be baptized. After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove in light and lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens said, and this is something that we should burn into our brain, okay? This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, there are several other pieces of Scripture where it says the, exactly the same thing, but they add, hear Him. Yeah. 
Well, well, repentance is, is repentance is part of the baptism act. You realize that you're on the wrong side of the Creator. Yeah. Well, he knew, John also knew something else was in the water, and it was qualified by what it was said. This is the reason why I was trying to put emphasis on this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And then I, I add in a couple of other places where it says, hear him. Well, it's one thing for y'all to sit out there and hear me, and I can hear me speaking, but I'm not special. But Jesus was what? A lot of people like to call him Jesus Christ. I prefer, and sometimes I stumble and I don't do it, but I prefer Jesus the Christ. Now, does anybody want to tell me what the Christ means? It means Messiah. The Savior. John knew who Jesus was. He's known from the very beginning. Remember when he kicked in his mother's womb? He knew he's known his entire life. That moment finally arrived. So with this, Scripture is pretty replete here. We look at the very next phase of what happened to Jesus as soon as he comes up out of the water. So let's go to, ch let's go to chapter 4. It says, Then Jesus, let me look at the time, okay. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Okay? Now, what's the devil, what is, what is his target? Is it your body? It's something contained in your body, isn't it? What is his target? It's this thing in your head. Okay, he's after your soul. Well, what comprises your soul? Your spirit? It's your thoughts, your thinking process. Who do you owe your allegiance to? How many people have I, I read about several things this week about Satanist clubs being uncovered here in America, in high schools, in colleges? Saw one yesterday, and it was so disgusting to read it, I just quit reading the thing. I didn't want to hear anything else about it. When I was a kid, that was like, what in the world is this? So here, he is confronted head on. There's no wall of separation whatsoever. No fiddling around. No trying to fake things. He says, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now there's that word tempted. How many times are you tempted this week? For something. My wife was tempted to break into the root beer that was hidden in the back of the refrigerator. No, no, dear, it's in the back of the refrigerator just like yours is because that's the coldest part of the refrigerator and it needs to be cold. But see where our mind goes? I do the same thing. Me and Debbie are always playing word tricks with each other. And part of it is to keep your mind sharp. Keep your mind sharp. Okay? Verse 2, And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. That's one of the prime movers in our life, isn't it? I'm ashamed to say that I have never been able to fast. I'm a weak individual. I don't know anybody in here that went a full 40 days. Araceli, whenever you were doing your fast, what was the longest time that you could go on a fast without breaking it? 36 hours. 36 hours, okay. Truly, the spirit is willing. But what's weak? This bag of bones we live in, okay. Verse 3, And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Well, what kind of temptation is that? Well, he answers. He gives us the answer to it. Verse 4, But he answered and said, It is written, 
Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Why don't you think about this? How long can you live without eating? Well, Jesus demonstrated 40 days right now. But what is he actually saying here? Man shall not live on bread alone, some physical object but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Well, how is this application? How can you live for God if you never read this thing? Or, yeah, well, it's a combination of everything. This is a common sense value here. No. <laughs> well, we, we'll all do, we all find ways to justify our actions, okay? But that's where you've got to be careful that you don't lie to yourself. Because how many times have we lied to ourselves? I'm not immune to it. Okay? It says, but of, on every word that, God, that, that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So let's continue. Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. He's way up, looking down. And he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. How many of us have ever been walking through the living room in the dark on the way to the refrigerator to get a drink of water in the middle of the night and stubbed your toe, especially your little toe, against the coffee table that you thought you were going around? Hurts, doesn't it? Why did I do that? Why didn't I just turn the light on? Sometimes this is called light. It's to remove you, to remove the darkness that surrounds your thinking. Okay? Common sense. Use it. God gave it to you for that. Verse 7, Jesus said to him, On the other hand, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to test. But what is he telling the tempter? Don't do this. What do we tell people that want to tempt us? Don't do this. That's what we should say. But how often do we? Do we have the courage to stand up and do those sort of things? See, this is one of your tests. Where's your courage at? In the closet? Or do you keep it out front to where it's used? Because sometimes, and that's most of the time, it will benefit the person that hears it. At least they will give them pause to think about what they're saying or doing. Or are we so scared that we might hurt their feelings that we won't say anything? I'm, I'm simplifying things down very quickly. I'm trying to get through this. So verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, All these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Verse 10. Then Jesus said to him, Go, Satan, for it is written... You shall worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. And notice here what happens in verse 11. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. Well, what does that tell us right here where it says angels came and began to minister to him? Who was protecting him beforehand? Was he not left alone? Look, he, was, he came when he was tempted, and he was hungry. One of the prime movers in our life. How many of you have already thought about where you're going to go eat lunch after, after church is over with this morning? I've given it a minute's thought. Maybe Tower Burger. <laughs> Alex knows what I'm talking about. But you think about this. His very first test. Let's leave him alone. And let's see if he passed the test. When he passed the test, what was given to him? Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. 
He passed the test. Seeing as that's five after, we'll stop here. But something I've been talking and going on and on about, and this came as a result of studying the Bible and realizing what it's actually saying to us about what our mission in life is. And the primary mission in life for us is to prove to our Creator that we are worthy to get the gift that He's promised to us when we die, when this mortal bag of bones dies. Where does the spirit that's inside of you, when it gets judged, what happens? What did you do with the gift, with all the information? What did you do with it? Nothing? Did you ever talk to anybody else about this to make them understand, to give them a more complete understanding? After all, if you learn what 2 plus 2 is, you should understand why it makes 4. But what do you do if you can continue to make sure that it's six? Can you stand up and correct somebody if you know they're doing that? A simple little arithmetic problem. Here, let's sit down and explain this to you. Maybe your teacher used four blocks of wood. Whatever example you can use. What about Scripture? How can you use Scripture if you don't know it? How can you know it? Not just listening to someone like me, but grab this thing up. If at the least once a week, twice a week, five minutes in a day, read it. Don't try to add anything to it that's not there, but read it for what it says and make application for what it says to you. And for those of you that are new to studying the Bible, I suggest you start at the New Testament and go forward before you wade into the Old Testament. If you do choose to read some of the Old Testament, I tell you, start at Genesis first. The first four or five chapters are very enlightening. What seems like it may be complex, but the more you study, the more simple it becomes, but at the same time, it becomes complex also. Because it's a study in human psychology. And if you're the creator of something, and you know all you guys that know me, what I do for a living, I create a bunch of junk all the time. You gotta plan ahead and think what's this gonna do? And you try to look at it from every angle, every possible thing that it can or cannot do. And how many times have I created a hunk of junk that I gotta throw away? A lot. That's just human. But what about our creator? How many years, how many years, eons, if human beings been around. And the thing is, the thinking does not change. It does not change. The only thing that really, really changes it for the better is right here. I don't care how many politicians or other preachers or anything else. This is the guide, the instruction manual. Okay? So, with all of that, I suggest to you, if you would... I want to, next week, I want to read from Matthew 26, Matthew 26 again, and Matthew 27. And I will come back to Matthew 4 here, because one of the things that happens in Matthew 4, and this thought occurred to me when I was listening to a Led Zeppelin song of all things. It's called the Battle of Evermore. What does evermore mean? It means forever. This same battle that's encapsulated in the first part of chapter 4 is the battle of forever, the battle of every more. Every one of us fight it all the way to the grave. All the way to the grave. And if you've never listened to the song, well, it's got some great music in it. I don't know about the words so much, but they are based, loosely based on Scripture. Okay? With that being said, If you can, remember next week, Matthew 26, we're going to read a large part of the chapter, and then Matthew 27, we're going to sum things up there. Hopefully we'll have enough time to do that next week. So, with everything being said, if I've said anything that's wrong, or anything that you have in question, don't be afraid to say something to me. 
I want you to. Okay? Thank you.